Okay. Uh, so today the topic for discussion is Banach contraction mapping theorem. Um, the reason why we are studying this theorem is because there are many cases where it's unclear whether an algorithm you have proposed would converge to the optimal point or at least a point that satisfies first order necessary condition or not. And in those situations, uh, the contraction mapping theorem comes very handy. I mean, that's not the only situation, but there are many situations where Banach contraction mapping theorem comes handy. So this is one instance within optimization where we invoke contraction mapping theorem to understand the convergence behavior of an algorithm. Um, contraction mapping theorem is a fundamental result in functional analysis. Uh, it is used in a wide variety of settings. Uh, and of course, optimization is one area where there are lots of success stories of using contraction mapping theorem. So I think it's important being a student in optimization, it's important to know about this theorem, what it means, and, um, and how can we apply it to optimization problems and conclude convergence of certain algorithms. If I remember correctly, Banach was a self-taught mathematician in early, uh, very active in 1930s, 1900s, early 1900s, 20s and 30s. And he has made seminal contribution to the field of analysis, uh, real analysis. So let's study what this theorem is. Uh, so T, so definition, uh, let's say X is a subset of Rn closed. T is a mapping from X to X such that T of X1 minus T of X2, some norm, is less than equal to norm of x1, sorry, alpha norm of x1 minus x2 for all x1, x2 in capital X for some alpha, 0 comma 1. <coughs> so T is said to be a contraction. Be a contraction map. So this is the definition of a contraction map. A map that maps a closed set to itself such that the distance between the two points it maps to is less than equal to the distance between the original two points, but it's less than a factor alpha which is between 0 and 1. Okay, so let's look at a picture. This is my set X. Here is my x1, x2. Okay, so this is x1, it gets mapped to tx1, this is x2. <coughs> it gets mapped to Tx2. This distance is alpha is less than alpha times this distance. So let's say this is your D1. This distance is D2. So D1 or D2 is less than or equal to alpha times D1. Okay. 
okay, then T is a contraction. If it is satisfied for all such points in X, then it's a contraction map. Any questions so far? So the contraction mapping theorem is, so pick X naught, let XK be T XK minus one for all K in N. So I keep applying the same map again and again, just like we do in optimization. Okay, so let's look at a couple of applications. <coughs> so what's the gradient or rather steepest descent with constant step size? So xk plus one equals to xk minus eta gradient fxk, I can define it to be the map T of xk. Or rather, I can define T of x as x minus eta gradient of fx. Okay. So, if you look at uh, this map, if you're doing steepest descent with constant step size, you are iteratively applying this map T in your algorithm again and again to an initial point x naught that you pick arbitrarily in the space. So in this case, x is equal to Rn. Right? So this is my steepest descent algorithm, which we can put in the in this framework. Now the only thing that needs to be shown is that T is a contraction something that you will do in an assignment problem, okay? But it is not very difficult to show that T is a contraction under some reasonable conditions, which includes that the second derivative of F at X star be strictly positive definite matrix, okay? The other example that we are going to do in a few minutes, uh, maybe after this thing is over, so if not in this class, then in the next class is uh, a Lagrangian method where xk plus 1 and lambda k plus 1 or This will be my T of XK lambda K.
Yes. So can this theorem be applied when uh, the mapping function T maps set X, which is in Rn, to a set which is in Rm, where n is greater than m? Uh, well, so the technical answer is yes, you can apply it. Um, but you need to embed Rm into Rn. And you need to make sure that the set is the subset to which it maps is within the set capital X itself. Okay, so to give you an example, here is a three dimensional space, and you have a point X in a three dimensional space, and your TX maps it into the X1, X2 plane. Okay, so now even though it maps into a two-dimensional space, you have embedded that two-dimensional space into the three-dimensional space. And now you're looking at the contraction coefficient You're looking at the contraction coefficient of this particular map. OK, so yes, you can do it. Uh, but this embedding needs to be thought of carefully how you are going to embed the range into the domain, OK? So this just requires x, uh, t to be mapping, t to take values in x and map it back to x. So in this case, x is equal to r3. And you are mapping a point in r3 to a point in r3. It just so happens that the third element is 0 after the map is done, OK? Any other question? OK, so what have we done so far? We have considered a contraction map. We are iterating. We start with some initial point, and then we iterate. We apply this map again and again, and we get the value of xk. Uh, this is something that is uh, that we have done several times. So we have done it when you do steepest descent with constant step size. Then you are applying this map t again and again to xk, and hopefully it will converge to some point x star as k goes to infinity. And this is the second example that we haven't done, we haven't seen so far. It's one of the Lagrangian methods, but this is the application for that particular theorem, which we are going to cover in today's class or maybe next class. So, the theorem hinges on, uh, the proof of the theorem hinges on what is known as Cauchy sequences. So we had studied Cauchy sequence at the very beginning of the class, but I'm going to review that part again. But there are two things that we need to prove. The first thing is we need to prove that xk converges to x star. So that's number one. And the second thing we need to prove is that x star has this property that t of x star is equal to x star. Okay? So there are two things we need to prove. Uh, if we can prove this, this part is very easy to show because t is a continuous map. So a contraction map is definitely a continuous map. But uh, proving this requires a little bit of effort. So what is a Cauchy sequence? So xn in Rn is a Cauchy sequence, if and only if, so it's a definition. For every epsilon greater than 0, there exists n epsilon in n, such that norm of xk minus xk plus m is less than epsilon for all k greater than or equal to n epsilon, m in n.
Okay, so what is a Cauchy sequence? So I look at, uh, I'm plotting k as x-axis, xk as y-axis, and I look at the sequence. as a function of k, and for every epsilon, no matter how small epsilon I pick, I can find a limit n epsilon such that if I pick any two points, uh, well, the way I have written it is xk minus xk plus m should be less than epsilon. So I pick any two points, so this is my xk, this is my xk plus m, and I see the difference between the two points that is less than epsilon, okay? That is less than epsilon. So what you can see is that if you look at the tail of the sequence, it gets closer and closer together in value. So what do you expect this sequence to? It should converge, right? Because the sequence is squeezing as you move this boundary towards infinity. So this sequence converges. So one of the theorems from real analysis is Cauchy sequence converges. I hope it is intuitively clear why a Cauchy sequence would converge. It's because the distance, if you look at the tail, the distance becomes smaller and smaller as you move this n epsilon to infinity. Okay. So now, what we want to show is that xk is a Cauchy sequence or a sequence generated by this iterative mapping T generates a Cauchy sequence. So a Cauchy sequence would converge, and then we'll go ahead and prove that uh, that point that it converges to is a fixed point of T. So this is known as fixed point of T. X star is fixed point of capital T. Okay, so that's the plan of action. Any questions so far? Yes. So this is like uh, this algorithm. If you had uh, if you had uh, some positive some identification that was greater than one, would that yes. still convert? Yeah. Yeah, of course. That would also be a Cauchy sequence. Oh sorry. You only all you need to prove is that it's a contraction map. Even if the determinant is greater than one. Even if there is yeah. What can be shown is that if D is, has a negative eigenvalue, then this won't be a positive definition, then this won't be a contraction map. That's why it won't converge. Yes? Uh, professor, is this method a generalization of gradient descent and all the other methods? You can, well, which method? Uh, the, uh, contraction mapping. So contraction mapping is a general result in functional analysis. You can apply it in differential equation, you can apply it in partial differential equation. We are applying it in optimization. But it has uh, applications in a, lot, a large variety of uh, fields. Um, so even if you go and take some course in partial differential equation, this theorem will pop up in partial differential equation. If you go take a course in differential equation, this theorem will pop up in differential equation. So it's a very powerful tool. It's my favorite theorem in functional analysis, uh, okay? All right, so I'm going to erase this part because I want to continue with the proof. So the plan of action is I need to show that xk is a Cauchy sequence, and then I need to show that whatever limit it converges to is a fixed point of t. Okay.
k plus m so I want, to, I want to bound the distance of xk minus xk plus m how can I do it I'm going to use triangle inequality k plus m minus 1 minus xk plus m. Okay, so I've applied triangle inequality to get to bound xk minus xk plus m. Uh, okay, now I need to bound each of these terms. I need to bound each of these terms. So let's look at x2 minus x1. What is x2 minus x1? This is p of x1 minus t of x naught okay so this is less than equal to alpha x1 minus x naught okay so this part is clear let's do x3 minus x2 t of x2 minus t of x1 alpha x2 minus x1 alpha square x1 minus x0. Okay, so I see a pattern here. Okay, and the pattern is xk minus xk plus 1 is equal to t xk minus 1 minus t xk minus 2, no, t xk. This is alpha raised to k. x0 minus x1 or x1 minus x0, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think it should be alpha raised to k. So this is x1 minus x2, uh, this is alpha raised to 1, x1 minus x0, this is x2 minus x3. You know, I, I probably flipped the sign, but it doesn't matter, right? This distance is symmetric. So this is alpha raised to k, x0 minus x1. Okay, yes? Should it be xk minus xk? Well, let me write it in, uh, I'll have to make several changes, so let me just make that change in order to be clear. So I'm going to write it at xk plus one minus xk. This is txk minus T x k minus one. Uh, this is x one minus x zero alpha raised to k. Okay, that's the pattern we are seeing here. Now, I'm going to reverse these inequalities here. So just uh, bear with me for a moment. X k plus m minus x k. 
xk plus m minus xk plus m minus 1 xk plus 1 minus xk. I haven't necessarily changed anything because distance is a symmetric operation, but it's just easier to write everything in the same format for ease of uh, understanding. Okay, so all of you agree with this inequality? Okay, so democracy wins. Everyone agrees, so it must be true. This is alpha raised to k plus m minus 1, x1 minus x0, alpha raised to k, x1 minus x0. Okay, so I use this inequality here. Now I see that x1 minus x0 is constant throughout, so I can take it out of the bracket, and what I'm left with is no, this is actually equal to alpha raised to k, alpha raised to k plus 1, alpha raised to k plus m minus 1, x1 minus x0. Okay, now I'm going to make you feel sad by asking about what's this sum equal to. Okay, <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't expect such a quick answer. All right, so alpha raised to k, 1 minus alpha raised to m over 1 minus alpha. x1 minus x0. It looks like nobody is sad. Uh, I thought people will be, but anyways. Uh, so, so that, that's exactly right. That's the sum of geometric series. So this is what you get. Uh, I'm going to write it as less than equal to alpha raised to k over 1 minus alpha x1 minus x0. Okay. So since you have negative alpha raised to m, I'm going to ignore that term and put a less than equal to sign. Actually, this should be strictly less than. But I'm going to write it as less than equal to alpha raised to k, 1 minus alpha, x1 minus x0. OK. OK. All right. Now, remember, for Cauchy sequence, I need to prove that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an epsilon such that xk plus m minus xk less than epsilon for all k greater than or equal to an epsilon m in natural numbers. So what should I pick the value of an epsilon? I need this to be less than k, so I'll pick k to be 1 minus alpha epsilon over x1 minus x0. And I will take log of this over log of alpha plus 1. Oh. I'm going to use the ceiling function. So 
so that it's an integer. How would you find the synapse? Sorry? How did you find the synapse? Ah, uh, I'll show it to you in a bit. Okay. Well, okay, let me show you how I found it. So I want this to be less than epsilon, right? Uh, okay, so I am going to take one minus alpha to the other side. So I, I don't really have to change the uh, sign because one minus alpha is a positive number. Similarly, x1 minus x0 is a positive number, so I can take it to this side. So there is some reverse engineering here, okay? So I'm doing reverse engineering. I want to show that this quantity is less than alpha for k greater than or equal to n epsilon. So this is same as saying alpha raised to k must be less than epsilon one minus alpha over norm of x1 minus x0, right? Uh, now, I can take log on both the sides. Log is a increasing function. So I have k log alpha is less than log of epsilon 1 minus alpha over x1 minus x0. OK, so all of you agree with this expression. Now log of alpha is a negative number because alpha is between 0 and 1. So if I take log of alpha on this side, then the inequality will get reversed. So this means that k should be greater than log of blah over log of alpha. And so I put a ceiling. Uh, operator so that it's a natural number and then I add one just to be safe. Okay? When you're doing mathematics, you have to be very safe. Okay? So that's why I add this plus one there so that I'm extra safe. Okay. Okay, so hope this reverse engineering part is clear to everyone. That's how I got the value of n epsilon. I defined the right hand side as n epsilon. And so then I can show that this term is strictly less than epsilon for every k greater than or equal to n epsilon. Okay, so this is a Cauchy sequence. Xk is a Cauchy sequence, hence proved. So Xk would converge to some x star. Okay, any questions so far? Yes? So does this mean that given an epsilon, we can tell at which step will achieve convergence? Uh, so not convergence, but at which step your error would be very, very small. Okay, so that certainly you can say if you know the value of epsilon. The problem is in most of the optimization algorithms, all you know is just use small step size and you should be fine, but you cannot actually know what the value of alpha, the contraction coefficient is going to be, okay? Unless you have some bound on the second derivative of the function. So let's say I tell you that the Second derivative of function is positive definite. It has minimum eigenvalue at one and maximum eigenvalue at 10. Then you know that no matter which point of the space you pick, your eigenvalues will only be between minus, between one and 10, okay? And then you can come up with an estimate for alpha and you can get the performance. But in general, it's uh, difficult to get that kind of insight um, for a general optimization problem. Any other question? Okay. All right, so I have XK plus one 
equals T x k. I know T is continuous. I know x k converges to x star. I'm going to take the limit on both sides. k goes to infinity x k plus 1 equals to limit k goes to infinity T x k. What is the limit k goes to infinity x k plus 1? It's x star. What is, uh, t is a continuous function. So what is limit k goes to infinity t x k? That's t x star. So x star is a fixed point of t. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I have a closed set. It doesn't need to be convex. It just needs to be closed so that all the limit points of a sequence should be in the set itself. So X star would be in the set capital X. So I want a closed set. I want a mapping T for which I need to make sure that it's a contraction map. So this distance should be less than or equal to alpha multiplied by the distance of the original points for some alpha in 0 to 1. And this alpha is independent of x. So it doesn't matter which point, which two points of the space you pick. The alpha is independent of x. Then t is said to be a contraction map. I pick an initial point. I let the iterations run through an algorithm. Uh, it turns out that xk converges to a fixed point of t. Okay. Uh, it can also be shown that there is a unique fixed point of t, which means that there is no, there, you cannot have two fixed points of uh, capital T. Actually, let's, uh, let's prove that result as well. So x star is a unique fixed point of t in the cap set capital X. So, Another claim is x star is unique fixed point of t. Uh, so let's prove it by contradiction. So let's say x1 star and x2 star are fixed points. of t, then I have t of x1 star minus t of x2 star is less than or equal to alpha x1 star minus x2 star, which is strictly less than x1 star minus x2 star. And on this side, I have x1 star minus x2 star is equal to uh, t of x1 star minus t of x2 star because these are fixed points. So t of x1 star is x1 star, t of x2 star is x2 star. And so you have this sequence of inequalities. And this can only happen x1 star minus x2 star is equal to 0. Okay. How did you avoid the mistake? So uh, this distance is less than or equal to some uh, small number alpha less than one multiplied by the same number. When would that happen? When the distance, when this number is equal to zero. If it was equal to one, then you can't have one less than or equal to alpha because alpha is strictly less than one. So that's why you can conclude this, which means that you have a unique fixed point of t. So we did quite a few things. We introduced the notion of contraction map. Uh, we showed that if you iterate a contraction map, you will converge to the unique fixed point of that particular map. And we used the Cauchy sequence idea 
from real analysis to prove that statement. Now let's see what it means for a steepest descent problem that we had initially cited as one of the examples. So T of x equals to x minus alpha gradient of fx. OK? Oh, x minus eta, because I'm using alpha for contraction coefficient. So what is the fixed point of T of x? So if T of x star is equal to x star, what does it mean for the gradient of f at x star? Zero. Right? So if t was a contraction and I apply, I'll reach the unique fixed point of t where the gradient vanishes. Okay? So the point would satisfy the first order necessary condition for optimality. It still remains to be shown that t is a contraction map. So that you will do in the assignment. Any questions so far? OK. All right, so let's go to the second example. Uh, maybe I need a bit more space for the second example, so. Okay, so xk plus one. Okay, so this is my map T. Of XK and Lambda K. Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm going to use eta as step size for this class because I'm using alpha as a contraction coefficient. OK, so somebody came and said that, look, I have a new algorithm for solving optimization problem, which is uh, run this iteration over and over again. And uh, I think this should work. OK, now your question, the question that is posed to you is, why would it work? And under what conditions would it work? OK, so let's assume that eta is very small, OK? So the step size is constant, step size is very small. All I need to show is that this T is a contraction map. If I can show that it's a contraction map, then, uh, then I'm done. Because what would be the fixed point of this T? X star lambda star equal to X star lambda star would imply that my gradient of x l x star lambda star is equal to 0, and my h of x star is equal to 0, right? So it satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. OK, so now the question is, 
is T a contraction map? Because if it is, I know that this sequence will converge to X star lambda star, which is the unique fixed point of T, and that satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. Okay. So the question is, is T a contraction? How should we go about it? <laughs> okay, use the definition. Uh, so first of all, what norm should I pick? That's the first question. Okay. So one thing that I want to uh, mention here is that T would be a contraction with respect to some norm, but may not be a contraction with respect to some other norm. Okay, so T is contra so the fact that a map is contraction depends on what norm you pick on that particular space. Okay, so let's leave aside the question of the norm for the time being. Uh, let's just. Uh, try to figure out what t of x1 minus t of x2 looks like. So, oh, this is x comma lambda. I want to give it a name, uh, y. So y is equal to x and lambda. So t of y1 minus t of y2 is y1 minus y2 plus half y1 minus y2 transpose derivative of t y1 plus some psi y2 minus y1 y1, y1 minus y2. So this is using mean value theorem. No, I think uh, there is no transpose here, sorry. There is no half also, it's just plus. This is mean value theorem. Oh, uh, I don't think there should be y1 minus y2 here. Sorry. So this is equal. Okay. Now, now it is correct. Okay. So t of y1 minus y2 is gradient of t multiplied by y1 minus y2. Okay. So now it is correct. So I need to find what a gradient of ty is. I'm sure it's going to be a ugly expression. So this is i minus eta. gradient of hx
Okay, so this is identity minus eta, which is the step size, and then the gradient of this particular part. So you have identity because this is x k and lambda k. So that's identity minus some matrices. Now the claim that I'm going to make is so. This is, I'm going to call this matrix B. So the claim is the real part of eigenvalue all eigenvalues of uh, B of X star lambda star is greater than zero for all I in one to N plus M. Sorry? What is uh, the real part. So the eigenvalues of B is going to be a complex number. Okay? And so this is the real part of the complex number. Okay? So let's assume that this is true. So the real part of the eigenvalues is strictly positive. It turns out that I can find a value of eta which is sufficiently small. Uh, positive but small, so that the eigenvalues of gradient of t is within the unit circle. Okay, so we'll we'll go over this thing in the next class because we don't have time. So I'm going to give you the plan of action for now. So the first thing is we need to prove this result. We need to show that if I pick eta small but positive, I can place all the eigenvalues of gradient of t in a unit circle at x star, okay? So this would be claim one, then claim two, eta greater than zero, pick eta greater than zero small, uh, gradient of t at x star lambda star, uh, the spectral radius would be less than one, and then this would imply that there is a norm on Rn such that this map T would be a contraction with respect to that particular norm. Okay, so that's the plan of action for the next class. Any questions? No? All right, so I'll see you guys on uh, Wednesday.